Hello, my name is John Rose, and in this video, I'd like to take a closer look at the paleo diet, and I have a really serious question that I'd like to ask for everyone who follows the paleo diet. Why do you want to be a caveman? Is this really your version of an ideal world where we could freeze to death and we have to wear dead animal skins to make sure we don't freeze to death, and there's not enough plant food to eat, so we have to chase down and kill an animal? and then eat the animal? How would we eat the animal? Could we eat it raw? Oh, that's disgusting. Well, if we put it in fire, maybe we can eat it. Is that what we do? Is that your, your, your vision of an ideal world? It's not mine. My vision of an ideal world is being on an island somewhere where there's so much abundance of food to eat that I just could go anywhere I wanted to and there'd be plenty to eat everywhere. And, and I knew that I'd only had, I only, really only had one main job that day I had to do. Everyone had to do it. It was a rule everywhere, and no one had to be told to do it because it was an automatic. And all we had to do is go out there and eat the food that we're designed to eat that has a symbiotic relationship with us. And then once we eat that food, we find the one seed that's the best out of everything we ate. If we can't find a good one, we go to our stash and find one of those heirlooms. And then we go out somewhere and plant that seed in the best place we know to plant it. Because we know it needs certain soil, and we can tell by the greens that are, growing, that are growing in the ground at the time, and there's a symbiotic relationship with those, and this would be common knowledge because we'd be passing it down generation after generation. For seven generations, at least, we would know how to plan and prepare for everything around us by only doing one thing. We only had one job. We had to go plant our, our, our seeds. That's why there's a symbiotic relationship with fruit. It's the only food that wants us to eat it. And if we did that, we would live in paradise because we would all be connected. We wouldn't have the wrong mentality. We wouldn't be eating animals. We wouldn't have any animal abuse. We wouldn't have war and crime and violence and heart disease and cancer and diabetes. And it's really that simple. Sounds too simple, but think about it. Everything that is profound is supposed to be simple. So when we look for the most profound thing of all, the solution to solve most of our problems, it's supposed to be something as simple as we're not supposed to cook your food. It's supposed to be that simple. So. One law, one job, get out there and plant your seed. We're not doing that. So I have another question I want to ask everybody. How many people think of cavemen as wearing dead animal skin, huddling in a cave, freezing to death, having to chase down and kill an animal, cook it up and eat it? If you believe that, and most of us do, that's conventional wisdom. It's popular opinion. And it's the reason why all of us have opinions on things. Most of us never even thought about it because we're having this bullshit implanted into our brain without us having any control over it. Whether we want it or not, we've got bullshit in our brain that makes us visualize cavemen living in caves when they weren't cavemen like that. They didn't live in caves. They were nomads. They traveled everywhere. Now, did they have enough sense to do their only job and, and eat uh, and plant those seeds. If they did, then they provided a journey for the followers. And that could be a fun way to live. And I realize that people are different personalities. And maybe perhaps certain races or tribes might be the same way. That some like to get up and move and travel around and others like to be homebodies and stay where they are. But whichever case it is, there is, as long as we're doing our job and planting the seeds, we'll always have food where we live. And if we take off and travel off into any direction, we're leaving a trail for people to follow us. And, the, and everyone will do the same thing. This could be a beautiful plan if we just got our act together and realize we only had one law relative to planting that seed. And I've, I've said this, uh, this story before, this uh, analogy to kind of put things in perspective. If, if I was God and I had a Garden of Eden for my children, I'd make it simple so everyone understood it. There's only one law in Rose's garden. Got two trees. The one laws keep them separate. The first tree is the trees of life. Those are the fruit trees that we're supposed to nurture. We get air from them, the oxygen. We get water, that's what's in the fruit. And we get our food. We nurture those trees of life and we get to stay in the garden. But we have this other tree of knowledge that represents the things we master. Rose's law, you can't apply the things you master to the things you need. When you do that, what happens? It changes and alters the need. It changes us. And then what am I going to do for you? 
I'm going to give you a feedback system. I'm going to wire your brains with pleasure and pain and let you know when you're doing it wrong. Why is God so cruel? Why does he allow us suffering? Well, Mr. Rose, God, sir, why? Why are you making us suffer? No, no, guys. It's part of your feedback system, man. When you get the pain, you're doing something wrong. Haven't you ever heard when you play with fire, you get burned? Of course we do. So fire is an amazing tool. We can do a lot of things with it. In fact, with everything we master, all new technology, there's all sorts of applications and it takes a long time for us to realize what we can do with a lot of things. And for humans, it took about 37,000 genera 37, generations before someone had the brilliant idea, hey, let's throw the food in there and look what we can do. Yippee! It's like a drug. Bored of just living in paradise, let's create a reality that's different. Let's cook our food. Yeah, we can only speculate how it all got started. I only care about making the change. And I know the paleo diet isn't the ideal diet. And the point that most of us picture cavemen to be a certain way should make us think about our belief system. And the fact how you can tell stories to people and they immediately come back with an opinion and the chances are they probably never even thought about it because that belief has been paid for. It's contrived. It's conventional wisdom. So if you believe cavemen wore dead animal skin and dwelled in caves the whole time, that's a perfect illustration how you can't trust your belief system. You've got to question everything. And that's the hard part. So how do we go about that? Well, the more we're aware of this, the more obvious we realize, is what I'm saying making sense? And if you use common sense, you should be able to figure this out. But remember what Emerson said. Society is always taken by surprise at any new example of common sense. What? We shouldn't cook our food? What? All we got to do is plant a seed? What? That's it? That's all I got to do? I'll do it. Paradise? Got it. No more war and crime and violence? I love it. Heart disease, cancer, diabetes? Gone? I'll take it. What's it going to take? It's, gonna, it's only going to work if enough of us reach, get everyone's attention, and that means we reach the tipping point. Things will never change unless that happens. Because we're herd animals and we glide with the stream of the crowd and it's difficult to break away from that. So we're always going to struggle doing the right thing as long as most of us are doing the wrong thing. And it's really difficult to get to the critical mass, the hunter's monkey. But man, when we get there, it changes so fast, our heads will spin and it can happen so easily. I'm convinced we live at a time right now this could be made, this could happen, this could happen. The knowledge is already out there. I uploaded a seminar on how to do the first of my three-step process. When we get enough people doing that, everyone will realize, oh my God, look with how this transforms people. We see it, we see it, we see it. I can guarantee you, I've thought about this enough. I know if we get 10% of, let's say, America to do a juice fast, a juice feast, a solid food vacation, everyone in America is going to say, how do I do it? And the government will get behind and say, we'll make it happen. We'll deliver the juices. Well, we want this. In fact, this is the only thing our government should be doing. If our government's working for us, they're going to make sure our needs are met. It's the only thing that our government should be doing for us. And now it's being used to control us. And it's all because we're sick. Remember, government's a subsequent need from being disconnected. The ultimate solution to deal with all the problems that we have with the government and the media and the money monetary system and everything else all stems from the fact that we're disconnected. That's why I always say over and over and over, if you, if you want to make it simple, you're either getting reconnected or you're getting distracted. Virtually everything we do is a distraction. Virtually everything we do is downstream. And God, there's a lot of downstream work we got to do. But if we don't go upstream at the same time, we get in trouble. And I'm sure some of y'all are going, how many times do I got to hear this? <laughs> well, just about every time you watch me, you're going to hear that because that's the most important thing I'm saying. We have to have a brand new reference. We've got to come to the realization that all these systems that are trying to solve our problems are not the solution. They're not the experts. And we'll never figure that out until you, you do a long juice cleanse and you see your problems go away. You go, my God, I had these for 20 years. My arthritis is gone. Gone. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's gone. Now, can I guarantee this happens for everyone that's 100%? No. There is a point of irreversibility. Which, is the only, which just tells you you're a fool not to jump on this right now. You don't want to waste any time, don't you see? There's an urgency for you to do this because there is a point of irreversibility. Don't wait till something happens because then you're going to be confronted with someone trying to force poisons on you, scaring you. You've got to do it now, otherwise you might die. 
or do I do something I haven't done yet? That's why you want to do it now, don't you see? You don't want to wait till it happens to go, well, I've been hearing about this. It sounds pretty good. Uh, should, should, should I do it now when my life is at stake? And they're, they're going to say, I'm going to die if, if I don't get cut, burned, and poisoned. My God, how can any thinking brain think that any one of those are going to be good for anything? Now, surgery, yeah, you bet. There's a time and a place to get in there and, and, and take out a tumor that's blocking the flow of bile or blood up to the brain or, or out of the brain or whatever. Sure, there is a time and a place. But that's not the ultimate solution. You've got to go upstream. And if we do that first, we'll be surprised at how many things we don't have to do downstream. And all the complexities that are involved in this whole scenario will come to fruition. And it's almost a waste of time to contemplate too much. And I've thought about this so many times, and I've come to that conclusion every time, is who knows how we're going to solve these problems once we get our act together? It's exciting to think if the most brilliant brains out there, instead of working to make people money, instead use those talents to help us fine-tune a simple life that provides plenty for all of us. And it can only happen when we change our mentality. Only one way to change the mentality. Can't think your way out of it. You got to eat your way out of it to become detoxified, but you also mentally have to de-indoctrinate yourself be aware we've got all sorts of bullshit beliefs put into our brain that we accept automatically because there's so many of them and we don't even think about them or question them. It's just the go-to thought based on how we've been brainwashed. So what do we do, my friends? How do we deal with these false beliefs? Well, it begins by getting clean so you can be in a better position to evaluate all these things. If you don't really understand the reason why we have all these problems, you'll never be able to make any sense out of everyone else who thinks they have a solution. Once you understand what I'm talking about, you can study a lot of, a lot of people and realize why they think the way they do because they, they have a limited amount of information. And if you keep working at this on the hero's journey, part of what we do on the hero's journey is we gather data. Once you stand on enough shoulders, you start realizing when you look at someone whose shoulders they stood on. So when I look at someone like Dr. Robert Morse, for example, I know whose shoulders he stood on because I stood on them too. That's why our message is so similar. There's basic simple knowledge that's been known for a long time. It goes back to the mid-1800s in Germany. Dr. Henry Lindler brought that knowledge over, started a college up. Herbert Shelton went to that college. And they understood how the lymph system works. For some reason, Shelton didn't explain that very well. It's, it's funny, Shelton left gaps in his story. I filled them in based on all my other research. And then many years later, in fact, relatively recently, I, I found Henry, I find Henry Lindler, Lindler, seen his name, but I never read a lot of his work. And I go, oh my God, I sound more like Lindler than anybody I've ever studied because he was taking that knowledge back from Germany in the middle 1800s. They understood disease isn't complicated, it just goes through a process of, of dealing with what we're doing to ourselves. And the solution is not to intervene unless we have to. The solution is to find out what caused it and remove it. And, and in just about every case, it's the food, but in every case, it's what we're doing. It's our lifestyle choices. So every problem that's within our control is based on what we do. What are we eating? What are we thinking? Exercise, sleep, sunshine, all of these things. How do we satisfy those needs? If we nurture the trees of life, if we look at fruit trees as the symbiotic partners on this planet as they are, and took care of them, and did what they want us to do, they want us to plant their seeds, that's the symbiotic relationship we have with them. And if we did that, we would satisfy all of our needs. The air, water, or food are three big ones we're getting from the trees of life. We need oxygen, right? Where's that coming from? The trees, right? How about water? Where's the best water coming from? The fruits. And where's the best food coming from? It's the fruits. We're not granivores. We're not carnivores. We're not omnivores. We're primates. We're frugivores. And... Most of us haven't been brought up that way, so this is a challenge. We don't live in an ideal world anymore, and having access to these items can be almost impossible. 
and very expensive, or both. And there's a lot of downstream work we got to do. But it's all mute if we don't go upstream. And what do we have to do? One thing. Plant a seed. It's all we got to do. Think about it. Wouldn't that be amazing if that's all we had to do? I'm convinced it is. If every person on this planet all of a sudden decided, I am going to do one thing today to make sure I, I'm always going to do it, and that's to go out and plant a fruit seed somewhere that I know is going to grow and plant it at the right spot so you have to get a little educated. I remember this guy uh, on a raw food message board many years ago. What, what was his handle? Raw organic produce guy or something like that. And he worked out at that nursery, I believe, out in San Diego and then went to Hawaii. And the natives fell in love with him because he understood where to take the best seeds and plant them based on what herbs were growing. And they knew he understood that and they welcomed him. Usually islanders don't like people coming on to their island. Uh, but they welcomed him because he understood that. And that's kind of, I, I remember that story, him sharing that, and it really resonated with me. He also had, a, uh, he and his wife had a baby out there, and they had a diaperless baby, which I thought was absolutely fascinating. Uh, but I'm digressing quite a bit on this story. But it does tie in a little bit. Nonetheless, we got to play our role. And what is our role? We got to be the best that we can be. And hopefully once enough of us start doing this, we'll figure out some way to plant fruit trees everywhere. We don't have to go out necessarily and say, oh, I'm gonna do one a day. You know, we can, we can team up and, and figure out how to do hundreds at a time, thousands at a time. But, if, but once we get going, it's, it's gonna be an easy thing to maintain. That's when we just say, okay, gotta plant one seed. In the beginning, obviously, that's not gonna work. But anyway, uh, remember, it's not always easy to make better food choices. So one of the best ways to initiate ourselves into this transition uh, is to do a juice fast or a juice feast and that's where you can go down below into the, the description box and click on to the first of a three-step process I perfected. And as always, when you guys do this, whether it's a juice fast or even a water fast uh, or a raw vegan diet, you are in for a treat.